bitch hot. Hello and welcome back to my channel, Big Nick Burt, with the Big Nick Energy. Shout out to Moomoo74. It's your boy, Keith Hernandez. I had to look that up. I didn't, uh, didn't know him off the top of my head, so I thought I was funny, funny, funny. I kind of look like him. Maybe a little bit. Anyways, here we are, another day, living it as a Knicks fan. I know a lot of people are questioning Tom Thibodeau's rotations. So today, we are going to make sense of Tom Thibodeau's rotations. I'm tired of people making the argument that Thibodeau, his rotations are the issue without really examining it other than to say, oh, I want so-and-so to play. And when they don't play, it's Tibbs' fault. So I looked at I looked at two examples, two great examples of when Thibodeau gets it right and when he gets it very wrong. This is going back to January versus Boston, all right? The infamous January 6th and January 8th games. So to begin, we're going to put ourselves in Thibodeau's mindset. Thibodeau wants to win. That's his goal. That's his mindset. That's his life. He wants to win basketball games. Can you blame him? No, you cannot. So how do you win? He says it all the time by playing the best players you have, period. So if every coach is thinking this same exact way, how do you win? Well, a big part of it is by forcing them to play rotations that they don't want to play. For instance, Boston, it's very nice to force Dennis Schroeder into a game, all right, and to force Marcus Smart out of the game. And now that being said, other teams want us to take RJ and Randall out of the game. They're our number one and number two option. They play significantly more than most other number one and number two options. So why does Tibbs do this? The short answer is out of necessity. We just don't have the offensive options to not play them 35 plus minutes a game. But the long answer is he believes that his team's conditioning will outlast the other team's conditioning. And then two, we run a fast dynamic bench, Obi Toppin, Taj Gibson at times, you know, we run a fast dynamic bench and that's designed to break down their, their bench and get their starters back in the game before they're rested. And we can see this. This happens often. And this is why we see so many comebacks for the Knicks led by their bench. The reason for that is because our starters are just demolishing, demolishing their starters, demolishing their bench. They have to play their bench an inordinate amount of time against us to make sure they're rested. They need their starters to be well rested against our starters. And Thibodeau runs these lineups where you can't really rest your starters against us. So we see that often and we see it in wins and we see it in losses so for example we played Denver recently and RJ got hurt in the last minute or so but most notably about that is first RJ was out there all right and this is a big blowout but two so was Jokic he was out there until about 30 seconds before RJ got hurt and what does that tell you it tells you both Thibodeau and Mike Malone believed the Knicks could win why else would you have Jokic out there unless you thought the Knicks could actually come back? And why would Thibodeau have RJ out there and Randall and, and, and all the starters if he didn't think he could win it, okay? So that's his mindset. That's where we're at with Thibodeau. Is it a little bat? Yeah, it's a little bat. But, you know, what can you do? It's uh, it's that, uh, that win-at-all-costs mentality. So whether you agree with this or not is not really that important. What is important is examining why Tibbs plays who he plays, what his goal is, and why many of the fans are annoyed with Reddish and Toppin, McBride, and other guys' minutes. I'm here to pacify your concerns. I'm going to pacify your concerns. So let's take a look at the minutes and rotations in the context of what other teams are doing with their rotations. 
and their minutes. Because that's important too. It's not just our minutes in a vacuum. So at the moment, the best defensive teams are Cavs, Mavs, Celtics, Warriors. So let's take a look at the Knicks, their rotations versus one of these top defenders, and that's the Boston Celtics. I want to examine when Thibodeau works and when it doesn't work. So when it works, we love it. January 6th. Now, if you've been watching all year, if you are a one of those Knicks fans like me who watches every game start to finish no matter what, this was eye-opening. It was a really nice come-from-behind win that really showed what the Knicks are capable of. But during this game, you know, each team started how you would expect them to start. Al Horford in the center, Mitchell Robinson in the center, RJ, Randall, Tatum, Brown, right. The usual suspects. But as the first quarter trudged on, Boston had the lead. And Tatum and Horford were subbed out with a little less than six minutes to go in the first. Very soon after, Taj was en- entered the game for Mitch. And this is not that significant when you look at it. But right after Mitch is subbed out, so is Marcus Smart. So what does this tell you? First, Smart averages about 30 minutes a game. But at this point in the game, he's on pace to average, to get 36 for this game. And second, when Schroeder came in for Smart, that's a big decrease in defensive power. So when you look at the first quarter subs, it becomes clear While Horford is important for slowing down people in the paint, it's more important that Smart is able to switch onto different people and also help on those post players like RJ and Randall. So to start the second, Boston played basically the same lineup that ended the first. Tatum, Freedom, Schroeder, Richardson, and Williams. But the Knicks went to their bench. They didn't meet their starters with the starters. They played Toppin, Burks, Grimes, Gibson, and Quickly. The game is almost a blowout at this point. Boston's leading 40 to 26 with 758 left in the second quarter. Horford is subbed in for Williams, and he got a solid 10 minutes of rest. Similarly, Smart stayed on the bench until Robinson came back in. So just like Smart was subbed out, when Robinson was subbed out, he subbed in when Robinson subbed in and smart got a nice 12 minutes of rest on the bench you know they're leading so they don't really they don't feel pressure right so the Knicks were down big and played their starters the entire second half of the second quarter so about seven minutes in all our starters are in in contrast Boston had most of their starters out until about four minutes left in the quarter they still had Schroeder out there until about a minute left in the second when Tatum subbed in to clock his 18th minute of the game. At halftime, this game is a mess. It's a lost cause. Honestly, if you were looking looking at the score at halftime, looking at the minutes, the plus minus and all that, it was a lost cause. But if you look closely at Boston's rotations, they always need either Tatum or Brown on the court. Horford can only play about seven minutes a quarter, and Marcus Smart is actually their defensive anchor. So Tibbs can attack this in a few different ways. He can either run a big lineup, you know, with Mitch that forces Horford and Smart off the bench, you know, get them off the bench, make them play against our our, our big guys, you know, our attacking offense. Or he can run small and keep Horford and Smart on the bench. You know, if they didn't if he didn't want to deal with them, you know, run a smaller lineup, make it so they cannot be on the on the court. So to start the second half, what does Tibbs do? Well, clearly he wanted to force Horford and Smart into the game. No doubt he saw the Boston rotations, and he knows Horford and Smart will begin to fade as the game drags on. First off the bench was Shooter for Smart at the 646 mark. This began a domino effect where Taj came in for Mitch not 10 seconds later. Richardson and Williams for Brown and Williams at a minute mark. And as they saw in the first half, that's a pretty standard bench swap for Boston. 
but what I find most significant is the minute split for the Knicks. In the third, Tibbs ran a seven-man rotation. Burks, Fournier, and Randall all played the entire third quarter, while Taj, Mitch, IQ, and RJ all played only half of the quarter. On paper, we see RJ was scoring well, having a really good defensive outing against Tatum. So why does Tibbs sub out RJ for IQ? What is this guy thinking? Going smaller, going with a less efficient score. And I think Tibbs' mindset was this. Tatum was feasting. No matter who was guarding him, no matter what was going on, Tatum was getting his buckets. But Brown was basically nowhere to be seen. Therefore, Burks or Fournier could run on Tatum and then swap onto Brown when they needed a little, a little breather. It wasn't that two-prong attack, you know. It was basically one-prong attack, which was, it's easier to guard, easier to handle. Plus, you had Horford in there who was spreading the floor, which allowed for more space in the middle and thus negated Mitch's effectiveness in the paint. Our starters were even were evenly matched, but there was a glaring weak spot in the Boston defense. And that's Schroeder. Whenever they took out Schroeder, or when they took out Marcus Smart for Schroeder, and all Tibbs needed to do was wait. Wait for Smart to get subbed out. Just like the first half, you know, they did it a bunch of times. Wait for Smart to get subbed out. So after he exits the game, Horford soon follows him. So now you're down both your your big your big guys, your big anchors. With 347 left in the third, Boston had a lineup of Tatum, G. Williams, Freedom, Schroeder, and Richardson versus the Knicks, Burks, Fournier, Randall, Gibson, and IQ. As mentioned before, Tatum or Brown are always on the court, so essentially this is Boston's bench squad, even though it has, you know, a starter in it. Horford and Smart needed to rest until the 4th because they knew, the Boston coach knew, that RJ is going to be coming back very well rested and they're going to go for a run. So while they rested, Tibbs wanted to capitalize on Boston's weak bench. Specifically, Tibbs wanted to exploit Schroeder at the point and use Burks, Fournier, and Taj to clear out space in the paint for Randall to work. It works well. Randall is able to get layups while Fournier and IQ hit some threes. It seems counterproductive to sub out a good scorer and defender in RJ for a smaller and less efficient scorer in IQ. But when we look at Boston's rotations, it makes a lot of sense. Tibbs knew Horford was not coming back and Tatum was so effective, it's like the defense wasn't there. So with Smart on the bench... This was the perfect opportunity to put pressure on Boston. RJ was getting more rest than normal and could bring in a lot of energy to close the game. So this is the ideal situation. RJ's resting while Smart, Horford are resting and Randall's attacking with IQ. The Knicks cut the lead to 12, but Smart is on the bench only four minutes before being called back in. Very short rest for him. This is what I mean when I say Tibbs wanted to force minutes for their best defenders. Because of the pressure we were putting on them, not meeting a bench with a bench, but meeting their bench with our starters, we were able to force their starters back in the game, to force their best defenders back in the game, limit their rest, wear them down. So we go on a run, end the quarter only down seven so going into the fourth the Knicks used a lineup of Toppin, Gibson, IQ, Fournier and Burks that's our bench you know nice strong bench versus Boston's Brown, Smart, Tatum, Williams and Horford that's their starters now Tibbs goal to start the fourth was to give Randall, RJ and Mitch even more rest because they were going to close out the game Boston Though they were feeling the pressure, they played their starters. No doubt they hoped to get some stops and pull the game away while the Knicks' top guns rested. Unfortunately, 
Boston starters were already feeling gassed. The Knicks were only down five when RJ subbed in, and they kept it within five with only 7.52 left in the game. Schroeder is subbed in, and Tibbs smells blood. With 7.10 to go, Randall and Mitch sub in for Toppin and Gibson for the Knicks' final assault. The lineups are now Knicks with Randall, RJ, Mitch, Fournier, and IQ versus Boston's Schroeder, Tatum, Smart, Horford, and R. Williams. The Knicks tied the game with four minutes to go, and Boston is desperate. They sub Brown for Horford, who clocked in 30 minutes of play. That's almost two minutes more than his average. This is a great example of when Tibbs gets his rotations right. By playing IQ the entire fourth and Fournier nearly the entire fourth, Tibbs allowed space for RJ and Randall to work. Additionally, by having a high-energy bench versus the Boston starters, he allowed his own starters to rest in preparation for the finale. Looking at the play-by-play, it appear it is apparent that Tibbs was coaching to win and never gave up. Subbing IQ for RJ was a bit unorthodox and even criticized by fans, but it's that faith in the bench that allows the starters to succeed. Many of you may be saying, why do we draft Obi Toppin at such a high draft pick and then he only plays 9 minutes? And to that question, we have to examine Toppin's role in that win. What was Toppin's role? Simply to maintain pace and pressure on Boston while our starters rested. You will notice he was not strictly subbed in just to play against the bench, but he also played against the starters. Now why is that significant? Because it shows Tibbs trusts him against both squads. Furthermore, while the minutes were limited, his role was essential in staging a comeback. To start the fourth, Toppin and Gibson went toe-to-toe with the Boston starters and did not allow them to pull away. Randall, RJ, and Mitch were able to rest with the Boston starters were down more, were worn down more and more. By running a fast dynamic squad to start the fourth, Boston was unable to pull away and in fact were run more ragged trying to keep up. This put them on their heels, and when the defensive liability was forced to sub in, Tibbs capitalized on it and got the victory. Now, is it frustrating that Toppin didn't get more minutes? Yes, of course. We all want to see more Toppin and more young guys. But nine minutes in a clearly defined role that helped the team win is far more valuable than Schroeder's 27 minutes in a stopgap role in a loss. I'm taking a look at these rotations to help put into perspective how important these limited minutes are and help clarify Tibbs thinking. Randall resting to start the second and the fourth allowed for a fierce comeback with a well-rested starting unit. At this stage, that's Toppin's role, and he plays it well. I fully believe we'll be seeing top and average 15 plus plus minutes sooner than later. But right now, he's got to play into his role. And I think as that second option, you know, that's that sub in for Randall, he's invaluable. And I know he was a high draft pick and I know maybe he's not reaching where other draft picks are reaching. But for our squad, for our rotations, he's dang near perfect. He plays completely opposite how Randall plays. You know, Toppin plays faster without the ball and can spread the floor even maybe with his three-point shooting than Randall does. Randall's a little more on ball, slower, etc. So when you sub your your main scorer out for a really high energy fast player you put a lot of pressure on the defense and that's the goal and we saw that in this Boston win that despite the nine minutes Toppin was able to really play his role well allow the starters to rest and when they came in 
finish the game out. Will it be him coming in sooner or later to finish the game? Who knows? I think it's possible, but right now, this is what we got. Now, all that being said, no one can say Tibbs is, is infallible. Only two days later, he plays the same Boston team, and they get destroyed. So what changed? Boston played Horford 10 minutes less. They played Tatum 10 minutes less. They played Smart 5 minutes less than the previous game. So Richardson and G. Williams picked up those minutes. So it's clear that Boston prioritized not overplaying their starters and allowing the bench wings to pick up the slack. They were not going to let Thibodeau force minutes on their starters and break them down over time. So let's take a look at the rotations and how the game played out. One note before we start is that Fournier did not play this game. So that's a significant hit to our rotation, but let's just see how Thibodeau dealt with it. So to start the game, the teams ran their starters. Knicks had RJ, Randall, IQ, Burks, Mitch versus Brown, R. Williams, Tatum, Smart, and Horford. So IQ gets the start over Fournier, you know, with Fournier out. And it's significant in the in the sense that, you know, IQ's a bit shorter, IQ's a bit uh, uh, less uh, of a defensive presence. But he can still, he can do the job, but Boston's wings are, you know, a lot to deal with. So this is pretty standard stuff, nothing unusual with these starters. But like the first game that we just looked at, Boston subbed in, Subbed Tatum and Horford and Smart around the four-minute mark. And Tibbs responded with Gibson and Grimes. And this is the biggest difference we're seeing is, is that this is not typical, you know, at the time. Is that Grimes is coming in for Fournier, but without Fournier, Grimes is our next tallest wing defender to sub in for Burks. So that's, you know, who we're working with on our wings. RJ, Burks, Grimes. And... IQ at the point, right? So interestingly, the Knicks were leading, and this pushed Tatum back into the game a bit sooner than normal. And so Tibbs must have been happy with this because he played Randall, RJ, and IQ the entire first quarter and only sat RJ and Randall in the second quarter, and he ran with IQ, you know, to start the second and after playing the entire first. So he must have been happy with IQ at the time. Clearly, they were winning, so everything was going good. So Boston used a similar rotation for the second, sitting Horford, Smart, and Brown in favor of Tatum, G. Williams, Richardson, Freedom, and Schroeder. And I thought that was interesting to play Schroeder over you know, any anybody else because of his liabilities. But with eight minutes left in the second quarter, the game was still close, and the coaches were still playing chess. Brown... Naismith, R. Williams were in. Freedom, Tatum, G. Williams out. Tibbs answered with IQ, Randall, Robinson in, and Burks, Gibson, and Toppin out. The issue, however, was Boston's wings. IQ started the second, but was quickly subbed out for RJ, running a Grimes, RJ, Burks, Toppin, Gibson lineup. A bit smaller than normal, but they ran this until the 729 mark. Clearly, Tibbs wanted to recreate his success from the last game, but without Fournier, he was hamstringed by smaller wings. Grimes could not attract the same defensive attention that Fournier did, and IQ got even more attention than the previous game, thus forcing RJ into the game earlier than I think Tibbs wanted. Boston tied the game with Schroeder on the floor, so when Smart was subbed in with five minutes left in the second, Tibbs responded with subbing out Grimes for Burks at the four-minute mark. This time, Boston smelled blood, and put and they put in Horford and Tatum for Naismith and Richardson to take the lead and close the quarter. This is where the game was lost. It was over. It was over. In contrast to the last game, Obi, Taj, and Grimes were ineffective off the bench. So who do we blame? Who do we blame? Without Fournier... Tibbs had limited options to compete with Boston's taller wings. Burks is an effective shooter and a competent ball handler, 
but he doesn't typically perform at the same level as Fournier. So Boston often hid Schroeder on defense by putting him on Burks. Likewise, Grimes is only a little shorter than Fournier, and he can shoot pretty well, but he can't handle the ball and drive or make plays the same way Fournier does. So Tibbs was attempting to make up his deficit by running RJ sooner in the second, but it proved ineffective as Brown was having his way with IQ guarding him. You can see the highlights. Brown shot over IQ six, seven, eight times. Likewise, Smart was able to body Burks in the paint while Horford took Randall or Mitch to the three-point line. So now we see Boston spreading the court and using their height and their size, not just, you know, hitting threes, but getting a mid-range game and making us making us pay for not being tall. Could he have adjusted differently? Let's just examine what we've seen so far, what was successful, what was not. We needed height at our wings, and without Fournier, we just didn't have it. I think relying on IQ at the same as the same as the last game was a mistake because his defensive cover changed without Fournier out there. So now he's got to guard Brown, which was very difficult for him. Instead of going smaller and faster, the Knicks tried to go one-to-one and they got overpowered by their by the Boston superior offense. So had Tibbs emphasized a fast pace offense, I think this game could have gone a lot differently. However, to emphasize a fast pace offense typically means limiting the amount of ball handling that Randall is doing. But oftentimes, Burks, IQ, and Grimes, they're often in the corner while RJ or Randall handles the ball. And this played right into Boston's defense. They were able to hide Schroeder and play help defense at will with their overall taller lineup. So had Fournier played this game, it would have been differently. It would have been different, obviously. But most notable is the lack of playmaking and the amount of ball handling RJ and Randall have to do. And I think that stifles our offensive creativity. So the question everyone asks is how does this develop our young players? While it does not give them a lot of minutes, Toppin specifically, it does give them a chance and a strict role that they can adhere to. And even though it's a small role, it gives them experience to go in, execute what they're asked to execute. And that's really all the difference between NBA or college or anything else is the NBA players can execute what they're asked to execute every time, no matter what. So it gives you a clear goal with clear expectations on how to get a bigger role. Look at Quentin Grimes. Look at IQ. Recently, they're getting success, and uh, they're they're earning their minutes. So we're seeing, at this time in January, IQ getting more minutes with a little bit of Grimes here and there. And uh, now with Grimes' recent success, it perfectly dovetails you know kind of sardonically with quickly's slump so there are some examples of Thibodeau having success and having some failures and I want to know what do you think he could have done in those rotations versus Boston to be more effective I know people want to see McBride but I don't think McBride is an answer to a taller lineup but like I said If he goes small and goes fast, McBride is certainly that answer. I know this is a long one, and I hope you could follow my my examination because I find it very interesting how the two teams, how the two games played out, where one seemed like a complete loss, and we ended up winning, and the other one seemed pretty solid and close for two quarters and then completely got washed out. I think Boston adapted well to how we played them the first time, and I think not having Fournier hurt a lot more than anybody will care to admit. But uh, what do you want to see from Thibodeau going forward? Do you trust his rotations? Do you think how he got that win was... Uh, such a positive that it outweighs the negative of the loss? Do you think the young guys are fitting into their small roles and doing well, or do you think they'll maybe be upset that they're not getting a bigger role? Specifically, maybe Cam Reddish, Toppin, 
etc., uh, etc., et McBride, you know. So let me know what you think, and uh, I appreciate you making it to the end of this video. I am Keith Hernandez with the Big Nick Energy. Bert knows basketball, y'all.